Um, our second presenter um, is Richard Cowan. Um, Dr. Richard Cowan, as some of you know, is uh, retiring from Brigham Young University at the end of this semester after teaching 53 years uh, here at BYU. Um, I, I imagine I've watched the steady train of people that have come up here at the to front to say hello to Dr. Cowan who have been his former students or people who have read his writings or been blessed by his, his contributions to Latter-day Saint church history. Um, Dr. Cowan was born in, in Los, Ange Los Angeles, California, received his doctorate in history at Stanford University. He is currently writing a history of Provost Two Temples. He serves as patriarch in his home state. He and his wife Dawn are the parents of six children, 22 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. We're grateful to have Brother Cowan's presentation entitled, Administering the Worldwide Church. Good morning. I'm just thinking that the two presentations, uh, Brother Alford's and mine, were, will be quite uh, different. His was a very close look, a uh, very personal look at how the church is uh, impacting a particular part of the world. And mine's going to be a very wide angle vision, talking about the world as a whole and how the church has met the challenge of administering this worldwide church. Now, when I think of the uh, topic, I, I'm reminded of uh, two buildings in Salt Lake City that, uh, to me, typify the growth of the church. Uh, the church administration building, the famous address, 4070 South Temple Street, five stories tall, built in 1917 when the church had 480,000 members. And even though there were just the five stories, and a large light well in the middle of the building and just a single row of offices around the perimeter of each floor, that building was adequate for the administrative needs of the church at that time. Well, in 1947, uh, the year that the church passed one million members, that light well was filled in to create additional space in the administration building. Then in 1975, the uh, 28-story church office building was dedicated, and even then, uh, leaders realized it wasn't adequate to meet the administrative needs of the church. So just those two buildings uh, represent the rapid growth of the church worldwide. As early as 1967, President Harold B. Lee uh, spoke of the uh, rapid growth of the church and said we have to think uh, regionally. And also cited the scripture that's been made quite uh, prominent in recent months, and that is uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verse 73, speaking of the Lord hastening his work, which we have certainly seen uh, come to pass in recent years. Well, what I would like to uh, demonstrate during this uh, presentation this morning is how the organization that was revealed, Doctrine and Covenants section 107, in 1835, when the church had only a few hundred members in northeastern Ohio and some others in Missouri and eastern Canada, uh, that organization has expanded to meet the needs of a worldwide church when we now have over 15 million members in perhaps 150 different countries. Uh, we're going to see how regions were created among states and later uh, areas among missions and how eventually those coalesced into a single organizational structure and how that has met the needs of the church. Well, uh, as the gospel was taken to Europe in the middle of the uh, 19th century, the, uh, the original pattern was for the uh, British mission president to preside over the uh, missions in other parts of Europe. And that structure continued uh, till uh, after World War II. The uh, European mission was established when Elder Benson was sent to Europe to reopen the work there. And a Pacific mission in uh, 
the, that area as Elder Matthew Cowley was directed to supervise the resumption of church activity in that general area. Interestingly, Elder Benson resided in Europe during his assignment. Elder Cowley uh, stayed at church headquarters. Now in some of the uh, uh, slides that we'll see, we'll have the little symbol of the church office administration building to represent those who were staying at headquarters and the Eiffel Tower symbol to represent those who uh, lived abroad. So anyway, what we had then was a pattern of uh, a mission presiding over other missions. In other words, the European mission presiding over the British mission, the Danish, and so on, and the same thing in uh, the Pacific. Well, uh, in 1961, uh, that structure was expanded just a little bit with a third mission, the South American mission, when Elder Theodore Tuttle was sent to live in Montevideo, Uruguay. And so the pattern, a general authority uh, known as a mission president presiding over other missions. Well, that same year, 1961, uh, in conjunction with a worldwide mission president seminar, six additional uh, groupings of missions were created under the leadership of a general authority, all of them, uh, all of whom would reside at church headquarters. Now, interestingly, uh, there hadn't been an official designation for these groups. The church news referred to them as mission regions, uh, small r. In other words, there wasn't an official title, but uh, that's what they were called. Uh, among the nine heads of those regions, there were three members of the 12, five assistants to the 12, and one brother who was in the first council of the 70. Well, in 1965, that uh, structure was expanded and a double level of supervision was created. A member of the 12 was assigned to preside over each of these 12 areas and another general authority, either an assistant to the 12 or member of the first council of 70 was uh, assigned to be the general authority supervisor as they were called. And of course the 12 remained at church headquarters and those who were supervising areas in the US and Canada also stayed at headquarters, but those who were to uh, supervise areas overseas uh, went to live in those areas. And by the way, the term area was used at this time. So that's the first time that that official designation was used. Well, uh, during the same time, uh, stakes were multiplying worldwide uh, the 100th stake in 1929, the 200th in 1952, and the 500th in 1970, and uh, the rest is history. Well, interestingly, uh, the early stakes were located primarily here in the Intermountain West, and the stake presidents were mature men who had typically been members of the church all of their lives. They had perhaps served as bishops for a long term and had been stake presidents for a number of years. So these mature leaders probably didn't encounter too many problems that they couldn't resolve. But ironically, they had very direct access to members of the 12, because during the early 20th century, uh, there were four state conferences each year, typically attended by one and often two members of the 12. So you can see that within just uh, say two or three years, a typical stake president would have had all 12 members of the 12 in his stake in his home. And so if anything did happen uh, that he couldn't quite handle, he could pick up the phone and choose whichever member of the 12 he thought might be most able to solve the problem. But after World War II, with the rapid growth of stakes worldwide, often uh, stake presidents were called who were relatively new in the church. For example, in Mexico City, a survey was done. A typical stake president had been in the church for five years, during which time he might have served as a bishop, say for a year. Most of them had not been on missions. In other words, just think of the uh, difference in background. Uh, well, their typical age was about 30. so. They undoubtedly would have many situations that they would need help. 
but it was not convenient for them to pick up the phone. Many of them didn't have telephones in that uh, part of the world. Uh, it would be a long distance call. Uh, there would be a language barrier. Back in the early 20th century, each member of the 12 would have had, oh, say on the average, five or six stakes. You know, if they divided them that way, they didn't. But, you know, just dividing the total by 12, that's what you would get. Uh, by the uh, post-war years, though, we're talking about several hundred stakes per member of the 12. So there's just a real need to provide help for these local leaders. Uh, this is where regions uh, came to into the picture. Now, regions had been organized in 1936 to coordinate welfare projects, but in the 1960s, they were broadened to coordinate all facets of church activity, and in 1967, a group of 69 brethren called regional representatives were appointed to assist. They were not presiding. They uh, would give counsel and encouragement to uh, these state presidents who needed their help. In 1972, this idea, this pattern of uh, advisory uh, people was expanded to uh, help with proselyting and the missions and a group of 29 mission representatives were called. And at the same time, more regional reps were called, not for stakes this time, but for mission districts. Well, in 1974, those two uh, patterns, those two callings were combined, uh, and the title uh, regional representative uh, continued. Well, in 1975, finally, these two systems, the regions for stakes and areas for missions were combined when uh, regions and stakes in overseas areas were brought under the general authority area supervisors. Then the following year that was expanded to the United States. Now interestingly uh, we returned to the pattern of having the leaders in overseas areas live in those areas and at this time the regional representatives were given not just advisory staff authority but more direct presiding line authority. So as uh, Kaleo Mayer, a, a student of church organization, observed, we had a, a definite chain of uh, presiding authority from the general authorities uh, through the areas and the regions uh, to the stakes. And uh, in this way, there is an, a, more of an accountability. And, and at the same time, there's more of a decentralization as more authority was delegated to these uh, local officials. But at each level, uh, Brother Mayor noted, there's just one individual, one uh, regional representative, one uh, area uh, supervisor, and so on. So a major new uh, development came in 1984 with the formation of uh, area presidencies. Now, this was made possible by the formation of the first quorum and later the second quorum of the 70. General authorities who uh, brought uh, more leaders at that level uh, uh, into the picture so that we had enough uh, general authority uh, type leaders that could be uh, staffing these area presidencies. At first there were 13 areas, now the number has grown to approximately 30. So uh, more authority could be delegated to the areas because uh, the area president had uh, two counselors and so they could counsel together. As President Hinckley uh, pointed out, the same pattern of presidency that we have in stakes and uh, even at the ward level at the bishopric and of course at the general authorities uh, first presidency level was uh, brought to bear in the areas. And so this is the uh, uh, region, or this is the, the uh, regional uh, worldwide organization that uh, serves the church today. One major change was made in, 19, in 2004 when presidents of the 70, the seven presidents of the 70, 
were given the responsibility to directly preside over the areas in the United States and Canada. So we have area presidencies uh, in the uh, overseas areas still with those presidencies staffed by general authorities living in the areas. But uh, the areas within the United States and Canada are presided over by the seven presidents as a presidency with different ones being appointed to supervise particular areas. Well, a major development in connection with uh, the worldwide administration of the church came in 1995 when the regional representatives were replaced by what we now know as Area 70s. Now the big difference was that a regional representative was limited to, well, the region to which he was assigned, a group of oh, maybe five or six states, whereas the Area 70s may serve for anywhere within this broader area. Just to give you an idea, uh, all of California plus Hawaii is an area. The southwestern United States would be another area. So it gives you an idea of how broad these areas are. So there's more flexibility. The area 70s could be assigned anywhere within that uh, general geographical area. Also, they have presiding authority, full line authority. So they uh, may participate in the appointment of state presidents when new state presidents are called and they do preside at uh, uh, area and divided uh, in uh, sub-area coordinating council meetings. The area 70s have the same authority as the general authority 70s in the first and second quorums except that their jurisdiction was limited to their particular area. And like the general authority 70s, they uh, typically serve for about six years. And uh, that is the uh, general authority 70s in the second quorum. But uh, unlike them, the area 70s typically live in their respective areas, whereas the general authority uh, brethren live at near church headquarters. Well, just in the last few minutes, let me mention that there is a significant uh, departure from the general pattern of delegating more to the local level when in 2002 two members of the 12 were called to uh, serve as area presidents. I can just wonder how many heart attacks there were in general conference when uh, the announcement began. Uh, we need to announce that we have called two members of the 12 to leave church headquarters, and I just wonder how many people were thinking, aha, the two witnesses in Jerusalem who are going to give their lives, is it that far along? Are we uh, that close to the second coming? But then, of course, it was uh, announced that Elder Oaks was going to Chile, uh, excuse me, Elder Holland going to Chile and Elder Oaks going to the Philippines. And then two years later, Elder Perry went to the Central European area. Uh, all places where the church was growing very rapidly and it was just felt that the uh, authority of a, a member of the 12 was needed to give direction to what was taking place in those respective areas. Well, in sum, uh, we've seen how the uh, organization established back in 1835 uh, has expanded through inspired direction to meet the needs of the current worldwide church. Uh, section 107 talks about the president of the church being a prophet like unto Moses, and that he and two other high priests formed the quorum of the first presidency. And then it, it spoke of the 12 as special witnesses with the responsibility to uh, direct the affairs of the church uh, throughout the world and that the 70 have a similar calling so that the 12 could call on the 70 for help. And we see that's just exactly the way the church has expanded with the two general authority quorums of 70 and now six other uh, quorums for the area 70s. I'm grateful to witness that we are guided by living prophets. We do have continuing revelation guiding the church in the world today. 
And I leave that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.